to have started? I just started it. Okay, so let me let me walk through the first few slides. These are standard stuff. I'll mute my mic in one second. Uh, close your video, which I did. And uh, please post your questions right into the chat box so we can ask. Uh, and, and are you okay with uh, answering questions throughout the session or did you wanna wait to the end? Sure, any time is fine with me. Okay, perfect. Uh, moving on, uh, the recording, it takes a little while. And, and the la last week it was a little longer because it wasn't a big blue button. It, it was a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, so it got posted later in the week. But we try our best, it takes a while for it could be configured and we'll post it. And um, Alfredo, can you post the um, online sh uh, short survey into the chat? So we have an on a short online survey for you to complete as well. Moving quickly, uh, good friend, Dr. Sabina Bavar will be our speaker next week. Uh, uh, I believe I've added on to the, her, the section on development, the research paper she's done on community development and connectivity in Mumbai. Uh, she'll be our speaker uh, next week. So let me turn to the next slide. And it's you. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, over to you. I'll just jump in. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Leslie Nobiel. As Glenn said, I have been with Aaron for over 20 years. However, I've actually been in the internet registry business for pretty much my entire professional career. I started in 91 when the internet... Um, was administered by the U.S. government under a contract, and we did the domain names and IP addresses together. So we did names and numbers registries. So I've been doing this for quite some time. My focus now is more on global internet governance, law enforcement liaising, um, and coordination. So I'm going to start and jump right in. Glenn, you want to go to the next? Okay, I, I'm just checking. A couple of people are saying they're not seeing your video or sound. Uh, I can hear you fine and I can see you. So before we move on, uh, yeah, better um, check. Al Alfredo, uh, can you see or hear? Uh, I just... Yes, I, I can see and hear her perfectly. So it's probably a, a problem at, at the... Uh, Oh, okay. Peter's saying it's fine. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, those uh, those who are having some problems, you could probably be able to catch. It's probably a problem on your end. I'm going to move to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so I just lost my face. Um, hold on. <laughs> now I'm having a problem. Okay, now I'm back. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about Aaron, the American Registry for Internet Numbers, and the Regional Internet Registry System. You can go to the next slide. So I, I'm not sure, I think some of you already had internet governance um, sort of uh, education through BSIG. So I, you may know some of this, you may not, but an internet registry, a regional internet registry basically manages the allocation and registration of internet number resources. The internet number resources being IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and autonomous system numbers. And I'll explain what those are in a later slide. But we do this in a particular region, geographic region of the world. And we maintain a unique registry of all of those numbers that we have issued. And that is typically known as who is. You can go to the next slide. That's our core function. So the, as Glenn probably mentioned earlier, there are five regional internet registries. And I, I just want to explain that before the regional internet registries were established, all of the work, all of the administration of the domain names and the IP numbers were being done under a US government contract. The US government early on in the 90s, 1990, 91, decided the internet is starting to explode, become commercialized. We need to get away from administering the, um, the, the internet, essentially. And that was a, a very wise decision. Took them a number of years to disentangle themselves from administering the internet. But starting in 1992, <clears throat> the regional internet registry system was spun off. It was separated. They started separating the domain name administration from the IP number administration. So RIPE NCC was the first to be established. They are headquartered in Amsterdam, um, followed by, uh, that was 92, I believe, uh, AP NIC was established. They are headquartered in Brisbane, and that was done in 1995. Aaron was established in 1997, in um, headquartered in Chantilly, Virginia. Next came LACNIC, and I believe LACNIC was 2002, I'm pretty sure, and they are headquartered in Montevideo, uh, Uruguay, and AFRINIC finally in 2005, and they are headquartered in Mauritius. 
So the next slide, please. So the core functions. So the, the RIRs do a lot of work. There's a lot of projects, there's a lot of tools and services, et cetera. But our core functions, the reason that we are in existence was to manage the distribution and registration of internet number resources. The V4 and V6 addresses and autonomous system numbers within our respective regions. That was the number one reason for our existence. We, it, going hand in hand with that is maintaining that directory service. We all know it as who is. We also have routing registries. We have who was, which is historical data. Third, we do provide reverse DNS. So the domain name registries provide the forward lookup, translating a name to an address. The, I, the RIRs translate an IP address to a domain name. So um, that we administer that function. We also support uh, the internet through technical coordination. Um, we do that with all of our industry partners, people like uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, ICANN, ISOC. Um, we have to ensure that we're all on the same page as far as technical coordination. And then finally, and very importantly, we facilitate a community-driven policy development process. Our process is bottoms up. It is managed by the community. The community determines what policies that the RIRs put into place. And this is true across the entire RIR system. So the RIR staff will implement the policy, but we will never develop the policy. We allow, we, we, we leave that up to the internet community. Anyone who has an interest in IP numbering, IP addresses can, uh, can propose a policy. So that's how the system works. It's open to anyone. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so basically, this is sort of a high level what the RIRs are and aren't. We're independent. There is no government oversight. As I said, the system was spun off of a government contract. It was turned over to the community in order to be managed by the community. Um, we are all nonprofit, not for profit. Our community funds us, our membership dues, our membership fees, um, pay for our services and pay for our function, basically. Um, the fees are for services, things like who is maintaining, um, you know, who is issuing number resources, um, providing reverse DNS, those types of things are what people pay for. They don't pay for the number resources themselves. We are all membership based. So it is open. Membership is open to all holders of number resources. So typically that would be internet service providers, telecommunications providers, governments, corporations. Um, it's usually the larger organizations that come directly to an internet registry for IP uh, addresses. And that is how that makes up the, the bulk of our membership. And again, as I mentioned, this is all community regulated. The community develops all of the policies um, we all have member elected governing boards. So the membership um, votes on the governing boards, the, the board of trustees. And all of our, our processes, our systems, everything is open and transparent. There's a policy development process that's published on each RIR's website, tells you exactly what the steps are and how it works. And um, all the board meeting minutes are public. Everything is public. We are completely open and transparent. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about the, the NRO, the Number Resource Organization. As I said, each RIR functions within a particular geographical region, and we're responsible for that region. But there are many, uh, many times when the RIRs have to work together. And when they do, it, it, we are known under this large umbrella of the Number Resource Organization, the NRO. So this is basically, we act as a focal point for any type of community input into the RIR system, but this is always within a global um, a, a global arena. It is not a regional thing. It's when there's community input required into the internet number registry system on a global basis. So the, the basic thing, so in um, areas like ICANN or um, ITU or IGF, that's when the RIRs work together because we're looked at as a single registry, basically, a number registry system. So that is that that's when we're typically operating together. So we 
you know, we pr promote and coordinate um, the number registry system, obviously. We are coordinating and supporting any type of joint activities. We do a lot of public speaking together. We publish documentation together. Um, there's a lot of joint activities that we're doing. And then we act as the authoritative voice for a, the multi-stakeholder um, process, the bottom-up policy process. We want to ensure that that is protected and that anyone can have a say in the number registry system and can participate. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to talk to you about Aaron specifically. Before I go into Aaron, though, I just wanna make a quick mention of something. And I had a slide that I did not put in here and I'm, I'm so mad at myself. But so when you talk about the internet ecosystem and where the regional internet registries fit, so what we look at is there's a core and the core of the internet ecosystem is the internet user. You, me, all of us are internet users. Who do we know? Who do we engage with? Who do we, who do we know? Um, we know our internet service providers. We know our content providers, our applications providers. We know Facebook. We know Google. We know AT&T and Verizon, whoever's providing us our connectivity. But that's it. We don't really know what goes on outside that circle and what really makes the internet work. So we have a wider circle called the enablers, and that's where the regional internet registries fit. The RIRs, ICANN. ISOC, governments, um, um, NGOs. Uh, this is where this is. We are the ones that actually allow the internet infrastructure to work properly and to function properly. Where all the public policy is developed that actually allows internet service providers to provide their services to all of us. So I just kind of wanted to mention that there's a there's a very big circle called enablers that most people don't even know about, and that's why no one knows really knows who in region internet registry is. Um, so specifically moving on to Aaron, as you know, we're one of five. We are a nonprofit, as I mentioned. We were started in December of 1997 and obviously 100% community funded. We currently serve over 38,000 organizations and our region is the United States, Canada, the Caribbean, a large part of the Caribbean and North Atlantic Islands. I actually have a map that I'll show you in a minute. Um, and this is our mission statement to allocate internet protocol resources, develop consensus based policies and facilitate the advancement of the internet through information and educational outreach. So that that's where our main focus is. Next slide, please. Our community. Uh, actually, we're and now up to almost 39,000 organizations that we serve. So there's more than close to 39,000 organizations that are registered in our WHOIS database. So um, we have our member organizations, which I mentioned are typically the larger ISPs. Um, there's 67, over 6,700 member organizations. We've got a little over 80 professional staff. And then our stakeholders are, you know, wide and varied. It includes governments, law enforcement, civil society, in addition to all those technical companies I mentioned. And, and essentially anyone who wants to participate in the process is welcome into the fold. Next slide, please. So our current focus, um, I probably have mentioned this multiple times. I hate to repeat myself. I apologize. But managing the efficient allocation of number resources. That is our number one focus, obviously. Upholding that multi-stakeholder model of internet number resource policy formation that we do on a global level along with our RIR partners. That is a very important part of what we need to push forward. Education, we educate the, the uh, community about the internet ecosystem and we have our current focus, and it has been for a number of years, is on the need for IPv6 adoption. I will talk about IPv6 in later slides. There's a lot of, um, a, there's been a lot of uh, push from all the RIRs for to adopt IPv6, and it's it's getting there, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and obviously, we want to maintain, develop, and enhance the functionality of our services, and we seek community input on that. We ask actually have a process where we ask our community. What um, what would you like to see us do? What would you like to see us improve? So we do act on our community and membership input. And then obviously coordinating glo globally to maintain this consistent, highly usable number registry system. Next slide, please. Uh, I Leslie. have a slide. Yes, I actually have a slide on the fellowship. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, uh, Glenn posted a question uh, oh, okay. uh, on DNS abuse and how Aaron is uh, 
dealing with that. So well, I, yeah, I, I don't know if you're going to touch on that later I on. Am. I oh, am. Okay, great, great. So I'll I let you talk about the, the fellowship. And then if program. there's a question after that, I can answer it. Sure. Thanks. Okay. So the Aaron Fellowship Program, um, I bring this in because, I, you know, we want input into the system from people who don't normally participate. We want other viewpoints. So we started doing this in 2009, and it was basically to, to get new voices in, to get new ideas into the, pub, into the public policy discussions, to see what other people want to, you know, want want as a public policy. So it was to broaden our educational outreach and to go to reach people who don't normally come to a policy meeting. Um, right now, we are virtual, like everyone. And like you mentioned, the ICANN Fellowship is virtual. So the virtual system is, is actually been pretty successful. Um, I will speak to, about Aaron on the road. <laughs> um, I don't have it in my slides, but I'll mention it. Um, so anyway, the, the, right now it's virtual, but we do plan on going back into a face-to-face -face, uh, fellowship program. But to, the way it works is you, we select up to 10 fellows and it's this, they're selected by a committee of volunteers. We actually have a, not a nomcom, but basically a fellowship committee who will review applications from fel potential fellows. And um, th there's a questionnaire that you have to complete. And then once you're selected by this committee, all of your expenses are paid. So you can come to an Aaron meeting and all of your hotel, your food, your plane, everything is paid for. And additionally, you're assigned a mentor, much like the ICANN system. And it's for, at, the, at Aaron, it's, it would be a board of trustee member, an advisory council member. Sometimes we have community members who volunteer and staff as well act as mentors to our fellows. I've been a, a, a mentor to several fellows um, over the years. So the, pro, the system is really good. It really helps orient people, um, new people to, the, to this, the meetings and to the system how things work, we introduce you, we tell you all about the policy process, we have sessions in advance of the meetings, et cetera. So it's a really, really good program. Um, I, I think that, I thought that maybe Glenn had been a fellow at one point, I could be wrong, but um, anyone is invited to apply. Typically, we the RARs um, open their fellowship program to anyone within their region. That's who we look at first, um, but we have considered uh, fellows from outside our region as well. So I'll just mention that. So Glenn wants me to talk about Aaron on the Road. We have all kinds of outreach programs that we do. Um, one of the ones that we've been doing for a number of years is called Aaron on the Road. And we go to, um, oh, I'll, oh, I don't, okay. I'll tell you about the board and the and the advisory council. Anyway, we on, with Aaron on the road, we bring a, a, basically a, a program, a tutorial program to an area of our region, of within our region, where we typically would not hold a meeting. So maybe, uh, you know, we have, have meetings in larger cities like um, Tampa or or New York or Washington D.C. But we would go to somewhere in the middle of Wisconsin, for example, where we wouldn't have a meeting, but where we can attract a lot of the local internet service providers and others to tell them about Aaron, the internet ecosystem. We're doing a lot of education on technical things like um, RPKI, which I will talk about in a later slide. So um, our Aaron on the Road, anyone can attend. It's free to attend. And we do a lot of publicity about it in advance. So as far as... Um, Oh yeah, Aaron, that's right, San Juan, Puerto Rico. I forgot about that one. Um, so anyway, we have a, I mentioned that we, are, we have a board of trustees that is elected by our membership. The board has fiscal responsibility for the organization and they provide the strategic direction for the organization. The Aaron Advisory Council was actually put into place to facilitate the public policy development process. So they work with the community to get those policies and to hone them and to get them into workable shape. And then they, they, then they advise the board of trustees on public policy and, and consensus, whether a policy is a good policy, whether it meets the needs of the community. And then the board acts on the recommendation of not only the community, but of the Aaron Advisory Council. So that's what those, um, those two organizations, but that's the difference. Both are elected bodies though. They are elected by the Aaron membership. Um, so can I move on to the next slide or are there any, anything else? Yeah, we'll move on. So this is our history and services. So if you want to know more about Aaron, this little booklet, this online booklet has 
everything you'd ever need to know. It mentions much of what I mentioned, but a lot more detail on a lot of the things that we are doing. Oh, I'm sorry you can't see me. Oh, I don't know why, because I can see me, and I think most people can see me. My apologies for that. This is a new system for me, so hopefully it's hopefully everyone else can see me. Um, okay, good, Glenn, you can see me. Okay, so anyway, if you're interested, please go to our uh, history and services. I am going to move to the next slide. Oh, no video. Oh. Okay. Well, sorry about that. So we're going to do um, a, just a little primer on internet num number resources, since that is our main our, our main core service is to provide these resources. I just want to do a high level um, of these because I'm sure most of you know what this is. So an IP address it identifies. Um, Every device that's connected to the internet has an IP address. It has an identifying number. Um, there's IPv4 addresses. There's IPv6 addresses. Um, you can see an example of an IPv4 address. So every ISP, every hosting company uses an IP address to connect customers. And there were a total of 4 billion IP addresses. We thought way back when, well, they thought I wasn't there, but in the early 80s when this was developed, when the system was developed, that 4 billion IP addresses would be great because the only people using them at that point were the US military and research and education networks. That was it, and that's what it was designed for. No one had a clue that it was going to explode and become commercialized and become the main tool of every single user, basically, in the world. Uh, so the global pool of IPv4 addresses was depleted in 2011. And I have a slide that talks a little bit more about this. So um, obviously IPv6 was developed. There's an example of an IPv6 address, very, very long, designed in 1993 when IPv4 depletion was forecasted. It was designed by the technical community, the Internet Engineering Task Force. And there's a total of that many addresses. I have no clue what that number is, but it was designed so that the numbers would never run out um, in our lifetime, in our grandchildren's lifetime, and in their grandchildren's lifetime. The intent was to have enough space to last forever, essentially. So an autonomous system number, that's the third component of the numbers that we issue at the RAR. So it's a globally unique identifying number, and it's used to exchange routing information between autonomous systems. So a network operator has to have an ASN to control the routing within their networks and then to exchange routing information with other internet service providers. It basically tells, te you know, exchanges routing information and tells uh, those IP addresses where they're going. So that is um, just the basic primer on I internet number resources. I can go to the next slide. Okay, so we talk about IP addresses and domain names, and I noticed that that question kind of brought domain names into the fold. IP addresses and domain names are distinctly different. They have different functions. They were developed at slightly different times. So an IP address is used by a computer. It's, that's what computers recognize, right? They talk in numbers. It, it is a unique number. It identifies a single device on the internet. And it's used for routing and for routing, basically moving information across an internet network. It goes from a source to a destination. That is how computers are talking. The numbers move the information from computer to computer. The RIRs are responsible for registering those IP addresses. The RIRs are responsible for maintaining a who is directory of all of those IP addresses. And we're also responsible for providing reverse DNS lookup for those IP addresses distinctly different and separate from domain names that those functions were separated way back in 1992 93 by the US government completely separate um, so a domain name it's a reference an IP address is an identifier a domain name is a reference it was developed in order to make it easier for us human beings to use the internet because we recognize names we cannot possibly remember numbers so a domain name will map a host name to a unique IP address so that the computers can talk to each other. It's a, and it's a hierarchical system. It's a means of storing and retrieving information about host names and IP addresses in a distributed database. As I said, domain name registries are responsible for registering domain names. They keep separate who is um, databases for those domain names, and they operate completely separate from RIRs. We don't have any cross-referencing with domain name registries at all. 
completely separate. And a lot of the abuse that's going on, the network abuse that's going on, is going on in the domain name area. That is easy to penetrate, and that's where much of the the malware and the and the phishing and all those things they're they're penetrating the domain name <clears throat> system. They all have an IP address, however. They they use an IP address, but the the fraudulent activity, the malicious activity, is actually being infiltrated through domain names. <clears throat> I don't think I have um, any slides on. Oh yeah, I think I might have one of the slides on abuse. I'll talk about that. Um, in, in one of my next slides. So uh, I'm going to move on to the next um, slide. So you all have heard, um, I think you've gone through the, the past courses about internet governance, and you know who ICANN is, top level technical coordinator of the internet, written names, numbers, and protocols, right? IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, that is run now by ICANN. It used to be a separate US government contract, but it's maintained the same name and the same function. IANA actually manages that global unallocated IP address pool. They control you know, the, the bigger pool of addresses, the global pool. They allocate that their, those pools of addresses to each of the RIRs, and the RIRs manage their own regional unallocated IP address pool. The RIRs can then take, and notice that word allocate, okay, because I'll tell you the difference. The RIRs can then take that space and they can allocate the space to internet service providers or they can assign that space to an end user. An end user is someone like a university, a government, an enterprise business. They essentially use the space within their own network infrastructure. They do not further reassign or, or subdelegate the space. It stays right there. If you look in Whois, you'll see when an address has been assigned or allocated. It's distinguished in Whois, so you'll know if a, a an IP address has been assigned to um, some business, it's going to stay within that business. You'll never see a further subdelegation to a customer. If an RIR allocates space to an internet service provider, they have the option then to take their space and give it to their customers. So they can reallocate it to their ISP customers if they have downstream ISP customers, and they can take the space and further subdelegate it to their downstream customers or an ISP can reassign the space to one of their end user customers and that end user customer will not further subdelegate. They will use that within their own network infrastructure. So that's the difference between allocate and assign. That's how it's, it's what we use in the Aaron region right now as far as terminology that may be changing, but um, th this is just a simple way to sort of look at things. So that's how IP addresses are issued. Um, the next slide, please. Global IPv4 depletion in 2011. This is a photo of the five CEOs of the RIRs receiving their last slash eight block of from IANA in February of 2011. That was it. Last block was, was given to each. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit more on the next slides about what's happening in that space right now. Can I go to the next slide? So right now, 2021, this is what it looks like. This is how much space is left in each of the RIRs, right? So you look at Aaron and you look at LACNIC and it says zero. So we don't have space available typically to give to customers. However, our, our IPv4 space fluctuates a little bit um, because we take space back. Sometimes people give us space back, right? Sometimes we will actually reclaim space for non-payment of registration fees. So we get space back that way. So there's always a bit of fluctuation in the amount of IPv4 address space that each of the RIRs has. Um, you can see that APNIC currently has um, more of the space um, than the other RIRs, about 0.24 of a slash eight. Afrinic has 0.11 and RIPE is down to 0 0.02. So we're, all, we're working with very little bits of IPv4 address space. Next slide, please. So this looks at our um, IPv current situation with IPv6 and how many of our members have come to the RAR to get IPv6 address space, and um, it's 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 not great, but but it's not horrible either. So if you look, I believe it's LACNIC that has most of the space. Most of the LACNIC membership, 96%, now has um, IPv6 address space from LACNIC. One of the reasons for that, I will tell you, is that LACNIC had a policy that was put in place by their community many years ago that said, if you come in to us for an IPv4 allocation, 
and you qualify for it, we're also going to give you an IPv6 allocation. So they immediately qualified them for IPv6. So they really, you know, bumped up their numbers by giving all of their members IPv6 addresses. Um, none of the other RARs had that had that in place. We had separate policies for IPv6. So RIPE has about 67% of the membership that has um, IPv6, APNIC has six, a little, almost 65%, Aaron is at 51%, and Afrinic 45, a little over 45% of their membership now has IPv6 address base. So we have some a ways to go to make sure that this is um, going to be successful. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Leslie, if I may, sure. I have sort of a technical question for you, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to address it, but if I have a uh, IPv4, uh, block, uh, and I want to move on to IPv6. Is that feasible and easy? And do you aid any organization that wants to do that? So uh, the, the policies to get IPv6 address space are quite easy. We've our, our communities have put into place policies that pretty much allow anyone to get an IPv6 address allocation or assignment. Very easy to qualify. The thing is, um, IPv4 and IPv6 are not compatible. So you have to dual stack. You'd have to run both systems. You'd have to run your network on v4 and you'd have to run your network on v6 separately and then tunnel between the two. So right now it's not the easiest thing, but what's going to happen, what we're seeing is that IPv6 is taken off like you know, Google basically saying over 35% of their customers have, I would say, I guess, over 30% of all network traffic being passed on the internet globally is on IPv6. It's eventually getting there. People are moving their systems to IPv6. At some point in the future, when IPv4 has run out or, or just, you know, it's no longer, when everything is moved to IPv6, there may be no need for IPv4, but it's a slow slow process. It's a slow transition. And a lot of um, what we hear is a lot of businesses are, are reluctant to move to IPv6 because they are still dealing with IPv4 and they're still seeing it available. I'm going to talk about that in another slide um, just to explain what the situation is. But um, really, it is easy to get. Um, and there's tons of public courses that you can take to understand how to transition to IPv6 and how to set up your systems. Aaron offers a lot of training on IPv6, how to set your network up. We have it online right now. We have ongoing classes and courses. All of the RIRs do. And um, Aaron's courses are free. So anything you want to attend is for free. So I'd advise you to maybe, if you're interested in transitioning to IPv6, look at the RIRs uh, web pages, look at Aaron's and, and use some of our resources. Is, okay, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you, Leslie. Okay. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go backwards. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So current observations. This is where I'll tell you where, what's, what we're actually seeing. So movement to IPv6 has been slow. It's been steady, but it's been slow, as indicated in the previous slide. Not everybody has their IPv6 addresses. All ISPs are slowly rolling it out. We're seeing a steady increase in V6 traffic. Like I said, over 30% of all network traffic is being passed on, is, is IPv6 traffic over the internet. And we have all seen an increase, a slight increase in, in our IPv6 requests. But people have gotten very complacent. And there's a reason for this. There's a huge demand for IPv4. We get, all five of the RIRs get almost the same number of IPv4 addresses that we were getting before. And there's a reason for this. There's a, there's an IPv4 market right now. There was po were policies put into place at the regional internet registries, Aaron being the first many years ago. Our board um, actually put this into place. They conferred with our community and said, if we don't allow organizations who have extra space to sell that space to other organizations who have a need for space, we are going to see a black market and we are never going to have who is updated and no one is ever going to know who's using IPv4 addresses. So we need to put in a policy that allows users with extra space to sell it to users who need space and then come to the registry and qualify under policies. There are policies for this, these types of transfers. We call them market-based transfers. There are policies that allow them to qualify 
and then to update the registry. We don't get involved in any of the financial transactions at all that is between the two parties. We're just qualifying, verifying, vetting that the registrant is legit. It's the legitimate registrant transferring to a legitimate organization who has a need for addresses and can qualify under the policy. So what we're seeing is a huge market for IPv4 and all of the, much of the activity at the RIRs is in this transfer space. So we're seeing a lot of requests for IPv4 space, but we're seeing a lot of requests for the transfer of IPv4 space. So they're increasingly turning to this market, which is actually perhaps delaying the deployment of IPv6 because there's a lot of extra space. In the 80s and the early 90s, we were issuing space to companies um, in very large quantities. Um, the old class A, class B and class C addresses where typically someone would get a class B, 65,000 addresses. Well, a lot of these companies do not need the space. They never needed that much space. So they have it now to, to spare. So they're looking, actively looking for people to sell their address space to. This has also developed a whole new niche market for um, IPv4 brokers. And they are looking for sellers of space, people who have extra space, and they use all the RIRs who is. They're looking for people and who is, who got their space in the 80s and 90s and who may be willing to sell it to someone else. And they're brokering these deals. And this is all being done legitimately. And they're bringing this responsibly to the RIRs to update and to qualify. So it's still based on need and the registries are still getting updated. But this this is delaying the uh, deployment of IPv6, this IPv4 transfer market, and we don't know how long it's going to last. So what we see is people purchasing space and using the RIR transfer policies to actually come in and update the registries. And that's great because who is gets updated, everyone knows who's using the space. We're seeing and hearing about purchasing of address space outside the registry system. And that's that black market I mentioned. And they're not coming to update the RIRs registries. So we don't, there's no attribution. Nobody really knows who's using that space. And we don't know if it's being used legitimately or for malicious purposes. There's there's no way to know really until law enforcement comes to us to tell us there's something bad going on with that space. We don't know about it. Um, and then we're hearing about leasing of address space. And this is, you know, obviously leasing. They, they use it for a while. And uh, some of the time this is being done by the use of falsified letters of authority. And so um, there's some kind of a deal and it's brokered and, you know, somebody wants to lease space and then they actually create a false letter of authority saying they are the legitimate registrant and that they bring it to an ISP and say, can you route this space? I'm, I'm the registrant. Look, here's my LOA. ISPs don't have time to check that. And so the ISPs are, are routing the space. And what we hear often, a lot of this is done for um, temporary spamming. People can make a lot of money in a short period of time until they're actually caught. So we hear about that type of, of, of activity as well. Um, what we're seeing on the RIR side is because of this huge um, demand for IPv4 and a very limited supply, there's a lot of fraudulent attempts at hijacking the space, taking over the space in within the registry, pretending to be a registrant and trying to take over the space so that they can they can control it and then they can sell it or they can use it for malicious intent. So we are very, very clued into this. All the RIRs, we, we work together on this. We talk about you know, techniques. We talk about things we can do to stop it. We've all increased our due diligence, our vetting. I, um, do I have any papers on this type of fraud? I, we may. I, I'll have to look afterwards. I, w I wrote a white paper years ago, but I don't know if it's public. Uh, I, I think actually at Aaron, by the way, we have written um, blogs. If you go to Team Aaron, we have several blogs about some of the fraudulent activity at Aaron in particular. One written by our CEO and our general counsel about a very big fraudulent, uh, big fraud attempt at Aaron. Um, somebody was getting address space illegitimately, lying, created um, shell companies, got multiple, multiple address blocks from Aaron. And we we knew we were suspicious and we finally were able to prove it. We got a lot of in, input from community members saying, we think this is suspicious. We worked with law enforcement. We took it to the FBI. The FBI actually arrested this person um, for um, email and uh, mail and wire fraud. That's what they ended up getting him on. But he it turned out that he was able to get 
about between the, the IP address space that he got from Aaron fraudulently was worth on the market between 11 and $14 million. So we people are very interested in getting this space and selling it. So we're very tuned into this. As I said, we've all increased our due diligence, our internal vetting, our internal processing. We, Aaron. Okay, here we go. Oh, do I need to? Um, anyway, so um, uh, internal processing, we're, we're all very, um, very tightened, really tightened up our processes because we've had to. Um, so that's internally, that's the stuff when people are trying to take over registrations and take over address space. So that's the kind of thing we can do as registries to, to sort of prevent some of that hijacking and the internal fraudulent activity. But we're also very concerned about the fraudulent activity that's going on outside, you know, the, the, the bad network traffic and, and some of the malicious activity that's going on. So if you can go to the next slide, I have, um, I have a comment on, on this as well. So as I said, so we're doing our due diligence internally, but we're very concerned about internet security and about helping to improve the integrity of uh, internet traffic. So we've worked, we've made a significant effort with um, the cooperation of our community and input from our community to develop some new technologies that are going to help improve that network trafficking, um, that network traffic, and to help really prevent BGP hijackings, uh, route hijackings, where people come in they find address space that's not been used, um, that is not being routed, that hasn't been updated in 10 years, and they assume it's vacant and that no one's paying attention or that someone has just abandoned it. So they take it over and they route it temporarily. And again, that's being done through those falsified letters of authority. They'll get somebody to route the space. They'll do a lot of damage in a short period of time. That um, this th So there's two technologies that we actually have developed that will help prevent the, those rad hijackings and improve the integrity of the of the internet traffic. There's the resource public key infrastructure, which is RPKI, and that is a security framework. And it, it was designed to secure the routing infrastructure. And it does this by verifying the association between a resource holder and their number resources. So it's actually verifying that that resource holder really has is, is the, not the owner, but the proper registrant of those number resources. It does this cryptographically. It certifies the network resources cryptographically. It does this twofold. It's a twofold process. Cryptographically certifies network resources and it certifies route announcements themselves. What's being actually announced by an internet service provider out there um, you know, in the public um, internet registry. So that is the most um, secure, um, technology we've put into place today, what we're seeing is it is taking off across the internet. Every single RIR has seen a huge uptake in people requesting RPKI certificates. And um, this is being done because the very large providers are all demanding that their customers use um, RPKI now. So Amazon, Google, Cloudflare, a lot of the big guys are coming in and it's increasing our RPKI um, certificates drastically. We are, it's just ongoing. And, and you know, really in order to work fully effectively, everyone's going to be using, need, is going to need to use RPKI. But even now, even this, you know, with the numbers we have, it's, it's really helping to secure um, routing. The second thing that we've worked on, all five of the RARs, Aaron recently, um, in fact, implemented ours uh, was a validated internet routing registry. An internet routing registry um, is where you put your routing information, your routing announcements. Uh, Aaron has a separate internet routing registry from our Who Is. Some of the other registries, I believe RIPE NCC, APNIC, and AFRINIC all have combined their routing announcements into their Who Is um, output. It's a different system. They use a different technology. So if you're looking in who is at RIPE for you're looking for an IP address, you're going to see not only registration information, but you're going to see routing information as well. In Aaron, you're only going to see registration information when you look in who is, and you have to look in the separate internet routing registry to find route, routing information. But what we've done is tighten this up drastically. It used to be anyone could put anything they want into the internet routing, routing registry. There was no validation being done. And often people would fat finger something and, and, and create a huge 
you know, a huge routing problem, a really a hijacking problem on the network by, by mistake. But on a lot of times it's being done maliciously where they're attempting to hijack, um, route hijack space. So validating, um, having validating the mechanism to the IRR has, has really helped um, fix that problem. So the validation mechanisms help to guarantee that the routing announcements that are being published are only being announced by an authorized network. So validated IRR is the second fold of, um, you know, the, the RIRs, tech, new technologies um, to help improve the integrity of internet traffic. So we're sort of doing internal due diligence and we're doing external due diligence as well. Um, I think that's all that I have. And I can't remember if I wanted to say anything else. So maybe we'll just see if there's any questions and um, try to get back to some of the comments and questions. Okay, uh, great. Let me let me go um, from the last slide. And Loris had two questions, and 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 I want to get to Herman's and and Bill's uh, comments as well. But let's start with Loris, and and it's um, she mentions the um, ransomware attack in the U.S. that that shut down the Continental uh, pipeline. But there was also a ransomware uh, situation uh, last week in Ireland in the health sector. It's a question. Uh, um, you know, a carrot and a stick situation. Does Aaron have any authority in its own to enforce any penalties against the registrants? Good question. And it's a question we get often. So Aaron's mission, really, the whole purpose that we were put into place for was to register, issue and register number resources. There's nothing in any of our bylaws or anything else that say that we can be act as the internet place basically, right? So what we're looking for is people that are coming into our own internal systems and trying to attack our systems. We're also looking for people who are trying to fraudulently take over registration information. That That's sort of what we control. Once an RAR, I mean, once an RAR issues space to a qualifying organization, right? There's policies in place. We say you meet this policy, boom, boom, boom. You have this number of customers. You're going to do this with the space. We do some verification and vetting that you are who you say you are. You take your space, you start to use it. We don't track what is being done with the space. There's no way that we can. We have a mission and our mission is up in the front end of it. Verifying, vet vetting, due diligence, issuing space, registering, managing, um, you know, doing, providing tools and services to help or registrants. But we don't track what is being done with that space. So we cannot go after anyone ourselves. However, we get fraud reports. Again, most of our fraud reports are about what's happening internally. Somebody's you know, gotten space from you illegitimately. So we'll investigate things like that. When we get involved is when law enforcement tells us that we can get involved. Law enforcement comes to us with court orders, with subpoenas, with requests for information. We cooperate with law enforcement. That's my job. I'm the liaison globally to law enforcement. We try to educate law enforcement as to what we can provide them, um, what kind of information we have, and we give them everything that we can, um, and that as long as we have a court order or a subpoena. And then law enforcement takes it from there. But we cannot... Um, we, we can't track what's going on with the address space. We are not, we don't have that authority and we don't have that ability at all to do that. So we're very concerned about fraud and abuse and we're always going to cooperate with law enforcement, but there's nothing that we can do on things like ransomware unless, until law enforcement tells us. I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm just looking to see if Laura said a follow-up question or not. While, while um, she typed something in, let me, let me uh, follow up on the same spread in terms of what Aaron does and doesn't do. Uh, Bill mentions here, the problem is more than companies are not willing to invest their resources in setting up to handle IPv6 mm -hmm. until they are absolutely forced to. I have mm -hmm. seen companies that have started looking at IPv6 five plus years ago, but have yet to start a project to actually implement it. So what do you do with companies that are just laggards? They're just not moving ahead and, and according to what Bill is saying. And he, Bill is absolutely right. That is exactly what we see as well. That's what we hear. You know, the only thing at, that we can do as a registry is try to educate them, try to help them set up their network. So we're doing lots of IPv6 training right now. 
it's really, you know, it's not that difficult. We're making the policies easy in order to obtain address space. Our board has pushed us that that's what they want Aaron's focus to be, get people educated and aware of IPv6, make it easy for them to get it and then help them set up their network. That's, that's, that's what we're focused on, but that's really all we can do. There's no laws that require it. The thing that, you know, we, we I think about is, you know, as a registry, we want community input. We want the multi-stakeholder process to function. But if people don't start doing the right thing, they're begging for for interference by governments. They're begging for regulation. So, so we just try to keep doing our part and helping educate and helping facilitate the process and with the hopes that people will get it. But like I said, I think that the IPv4 market is, is delaying the IPv6 um, implementation fully. So it is helping with those procrastinators unfortunately. Um, so if I go on the same thread, um, following up with Bill, with Herman's uh, comments, and then I'll get to Laura's. Uh, Herman uh, says an interesting comment here. He says, considering the slow adoption of IPv6, does IPv4 market is helping the adoption of IPv6 on the internet by providing companies more time to plan their migration, or is, is is it jeopardizing even more the IPv6 adoption by giving a false impression that IPv6 is not needed for the future of the internet? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's, I think both parts of it are correct, actually. I think it's doing both. Um, I think what's going to happen is the market's going to be here for a while. No one's going to predict when it goes away, meaning the V4 market. People are going to continue to procrastinate and not implement IPv6, and then they're going to hit the dead wall. And they're going to be out of V4, and they're not going to have implemented IPv6, and they're going to be in a terrible bind because it's not, you know, an instant switch. It requires education. It requires equipment. It requires software. It requires strategic planning, you know, business planning. So there's going to be people that get stuck in this situation. And, um, you know, it's... I don't know what to say, <laughs> but it, both parts of that question are absolutely true, or that statement. Great. Uh, let me let me turn to uh, Loris, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Alfredo. Um, Loris says, does Aaron's policymaking interface with ICANN and, and governments, uh, what, what is the situation in, in terms of that interface? But she also goes on to say, are there any issues for the number address parity that Aaron must regularly address between RERs? So she's saying if they adopt a, a policy, maybe an APNEC, are you automatically obligated to do the same thing? So that, that's Loris's question. That's a good question. Um, I'll, since I remember that one, <laughs> I'll go to that one first. So each regional internet registry's communities develop policies based on their own internal needs. There is no parity. We don't have to adopt the same policies. However, there are times when one community might adopt a policy that completely counteracts and contradicts another RIR's policy and essentially would make it impossible to work together. Um, there was a policy for uh, IPv4 transfers between the RIPE NCC and Aaron. RIPE's community put in a policy that said anybody can transfer their IPv4 address space. They can sell it to whoever they want. There's no need, um, no justification required just sell it wherever you want it. And the Aaron community came back and said, if that happens, we can't, we can't do, um, we can't do transfers with you. You, you, we won't, we won't be allowed to transfer space, IPv4 space from one of our members into your community's member and vice versa, because that does not meet our policy. It's completely the opposite of our policy. So the right community actually modified their policy so that it was compatible. That was with called an inter RAR transfer policy where we were moving, where someone was moving space from one RAR into another. Those, we required those policies to be compatible. Other than that, they're always regional and they're always determined by the community. So no parity. That's part number one. As far as ICANN goes, the only policies that the RARs coordinate with ICANN on are called global policies. A global policy involves IANA, who issues that larger global pool of resources to the regional internet registries. If, if there's a policy, for example, um, that, that affects 
all five of the RARs and it's global. And it's because I, it's, it talks about the way IANA is issuing resources to the RARs. That is the only time that we engage on policy with ICANN. If it's a global policy that is directly impacted, um, impacting IANA and the RARs relationship. So that's that. Okay, Leslie, I do, I do have a, a question for you. Uh, you've talked about the who is uh, database and so forth. Now, my question is, how has that the uh, GDPR uh, regulation in, in Europe affected uh, the who is database that you manage? Okay, so this is a great question. And I, I often, I always talk about this when I'm talking to law enforcement, because they're very interested in this. As you know, GDPR has a impacted ICANN and, um, and the domain name registries and registrars who is. ICANN has allowed the domain name registries and registrars to essentially hide their data, what they're calling personal data. So you can no longer see essentially most of the registries and registrars who is. You can't really find much information. In the air and in the RAR regions, we've conferred together. Our, our general counsels have talked, our boards have talked. We believe that it is power, part of our mission and our job to provide public information about who is using IP addresses. This helps network operators. This helps law enforcement. It helps a lot of different people um, do their jobs. And it's part of our original formation. It is why we were formed, to have a public registry of all IP number resources that we issue. So this has not impacted uh, our who is at all. Our who is contains the exact same data that it always has, and it's publicly viewable. I will tell you that the RIPE NCC, because they're in GDPR land, right in the heart of it, their community is having new discussions on what should be in the public database. They haven't made any decisions, but there is there's ongoing discussion. So I'm not sure what's going to come out of that. But right now, the other four RARs, well, all five RARs maintain a public who is registry? Okay, so there's a question from Herman Ramos, uh, and it reads something like uh, Many kinds of innovation are being uh, developed uh, now or will be in the future to replace something in the current internet uh, coming directly from companies and organizations. Uh, an example was the proposed. A proposal for a new internet-like architecture. I guess he's talking about the other new, the new mm -hmm. IP idea, which aims to develop uh, a set of protocols that could replace the current internet. Is mm -hmm. this the right step for the future, or are we still have to continue the actual way of things? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're all aware. Um, those of us who work in internet governance are all aware of new IP, which is coming out of China. Um, so we have put out some statements, I believe RIPE NCC has published a statement and I think we all support it at the RIRs that we don't think that's the way forward. We believe that, um, you know, the current system works as designed and, um, you know, we're waiting to see what happens and whether there are going to be enhancements, but we can't, we don't see the need for a replacement for new IP at this point. And, um, I don't want to be politically incorrect and say anything, so <laughs> I think I'm going to leave it at that. If that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's okay, Leslie. Actually, we we talk about the uh, the new IP and the uh, uh, splinternet or the fragmentation of the internet. Exactly. In one exactly. of the modules. So so I I know you don't want to publicly yeah. address that. Yeah. So uh, we're almost uh, at the top of the hour, and if there is not any more questions. I would like to thank you, Leslie, for your excellent presentation and your willingness uh, to answer uh, our questions. Uh, and I know that we could actually keep on going with more questions, but uh, every participant here is conscious that we only have uh, 60 minutes to cover the topic. But mm -hmm. if you're available uh, during the remainder of the uh, of this group of students or participants, uh, part, uh, I encourage you to, to ask uh, questions through the discussion threads and I'm sure that Leslie will read them and, and answer them as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and for inviting Aaron. Sure. We, we hope to see you or somebody else in, in our next uh, cohorts as we move forward. We're happy to participate. Yep. So Glenn, any final words? 
Glenn, are you there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I guess Glenn. I, 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 yeah, I'm here. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> I, I always mute so that I, I don't have any side distraction. Hey, this was great. Uh, I can't believe an hour whipped by so quickly, Les. And, and as always, you're charming and intelligent and, and, and most most interesting session. And I thank you so much for your time. I also have to do a declaration for everybody on the call. Aaron has been a generous sponsor um, for VSIG. And, and I'd like to thank you, Leslie, and, and Aaron organization and sponsoring us. So again, thank you for your support. Uh, OK, thank you. And, and again, folks, uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, as I said, Dr. Ballur will be our speaker. And, and any final comments, Leslie? Uh, no, just very happy to be here. And, and um, if anyone has questions, my email is leslie at aaron.net. So if you can, you can send me anything you have. Thanks for your attention. Okay, great. thank you. And with thank, this, thank you. With this, we end this session. Have a great day, wherever you're from. Bye. Bye.